first time at Masonic Temple. All the way from Valdosta, Georgia, Dr. Malefi Asante. Let's give Dr. Asante a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hotel. All right. Sister Shashi. Hotel. Brothers and sisters, it's good to see you. I am always honored to be at the United African Movement. Now, sometimes I think that this is a place where I ought to be often. And I want to thank Brother Maddox for his very fine way of introducing me. And I have with me Brother Thomas Waisu Aden. Young brother, thank you. <clears throat> Young brother who's a research assistant of mine and a PhD student at Temple. And in my judgment, he's one of the finest PhD students I have ever met. Uh, he is um, originally from the country of Benin. Uh, he is fluent in many languages. He has mastered the Afrocentric idea and he has presented his arguments in published form setting straight people like Kwame Apia and Henry Gates. He is a very strong young man. His, um, his record you will hear from uh, many years to come. I stand here tonight with the spirit of Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint of Alada, of Haiti, with the spirit of Harriet Tubman, with the spirit of Nani of Jamaica, with the spirit of Frederick Douglass, who knew that we could not achieve anything without struggle. I stand here tonight honored that Nat Turner and David Walker lived and that if they had not lived we would have had to create them because of the struggle and the oppression that we have resisted in this land. I stand here tonight knowing that the Egugun, that the Nananam in Samamfo, that the Orishas, that all Set and all Sa, that all of the ancestral spirits are with us tonight. So I'm happy to be here. And I come to the United African movement to let you know that whatever you have heard about Temple, that we will not only survive, we will be victorious. There is, there is, there is no way that those with whom I am in solidarity will allow any small cabal of individual agents to try to destabilize the premier department of African American studies in this country. It won't happen. I have, I have for the last year been in struggle against enemies within my camp. Young people and old people who have conspired against the Afrocentric movement. But I must tell you 
that each day we get stronger. We have spoken, I've spoken many times to our people at Temple and I've told them that when you look around the country and you see the attacks on African people, when you look around the country and you see the attacks in the academy on Afrocentric scholars and education, when you see the undermining of Africana Studies Department, don't believe for a minute that because we think we are strong that the enemies will not try to bring us down. I told them that. And let me tell you something. The story at Temple is simple, and it is this, that through my generosity, I came to a number of our professors, and I said to them, because I have contracts with a publishing company, I will be very happy to jointly co-author books with y'all so that y'all can publish just as well. That's my generosity. I didn't have to do it. But because of my generosity, what happened was that one of these professors who got angry in the process decided that she didn't want to go on with the process, signed a separate agreement with the publisher telling the publisher, you could use up to 30% of anything I've created in the joint project with Dr. Asante, but just don't use my name. And when the book came out, she then said that we had published a book with materials that she had created, but it was not materials that she had created in the first place. It was a joint contract co-author of a series of books, and that one particularly in which I was the senior author. So it's almost like telling somebody that they are taking information from some manuscript that they had been involved in producing in the first places, a place and using it in a book. You know what the white people did? The white people saw this as an opening. They were looking for an opening. They had never found an opening because we had been strong, and we're still strong, but they had never found an opening. And they found an opening through agents within our department to then try to attack me. And I stood, I've stood before two, three of their committees, and on every time I have knocked them down, because truth will always out. But let me tell you something. Right here at the UAM, I brought some of these individuals right here to you. Those same individuals turned against me right at Temple. I'm going to tell you something. I have little faith in people who just talk to me. I want to see works and action. I want to see what people be, how people behave, how they do, because we can find a lot of individuals who will talk, but a few individuals who will stand when the time is right for them to stand. So I tell you, I am here tonight with the spirit of the ancestors strong behind me and with me, and I know that whatever we are going through, we will win and we will be victorious. And I'll tell you something else too. When we win victoriously and strongly, we are then gonna have to clean house. Let me tell you something. Now, let me tell you something. I, I do not believe in disloyalty. I don't believe in loyalty counts for something. It has to count for something. Otherwise, you have no discipline. And part of the problem that we have had in our organizations, we don't understand discipline. Fundamental. You have to have discipline. We're in a struggle. It's an international struggle. But yes, we've got to make certain that individuals who are trying to undermine the quality, 
the standards of excellence of our department, we've got to make sure that those individuals will come to a terminal end in the program and go somewhere else. That's what we have to do. It's just fundamental. You cannot run an institution where you have people who are trying to destroy from inside the very foundations of an organization. You can't run an organization like that. One of the things I love Marcus Garvey for is because he understood organization. And he understood the necessity for vigilance and discipline. And not only that, but as a child of the 60s, having seen in my classes at UCLA FBI agents sitting right in my class, having later found them out to be FBI agents, I believe we got agents in the 1990s. I'm not surprised by it. I am, I've never been surprised by it. And in the UAB, you better watch out. You know, I know what the struggle is about. And what the struggle is about is that whenever African people are doing anything that's progressive and powerful, and we are moving in a way that seems like we are on the edge of liberation, then comes the devil, up pops the devil, to try to bring you down. It ain't gonna happen, not with Temple. And in fact, we're in the throes of the struggle and we're just getting stronger. And I wanna say this, that, and I said this earlier, I do not hold um, any ill will toward anybody, any African. I don't, um, uh, the comments that may have been made by me, and I say may have been made by me because sometimes you know the newspaper get things wrong. I don't know whether the comments are right or wrong or whether they were said or not said. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to me is that I know that my works speak for me. And I have tried very hard not to cite my works. But I have educated, I have personally seen to it that at least 60 black people get PhDs. I have directed their dissertations. I don't know, there may be other people with that record, I don't know, but my own works speak for me. I don't know how many people have mentored people for jobs, but I have five of my students right now who are running black studies departments. I don't know what other people have done. But my work speaks for me. I have tried to help other scholars get published in the Journal of Black Studies, and I have published over 200 black scholars to help them get tenure in the Journal of Black Studies. That's my work. So I don't, you know, and I don't tell this story often. And sometimes I think I should. Because people say, well, you know, maybe he didn't do that. Maybe he didn't write 38 books. Maybe he didn't. You know, I don't know. And that's why it's so wonderful. We'll talk about the book that's back there tonight, The African Intellectual Heritage. We'll talk about it a little bit. Talk about how it came about. But I, I'm saying this to you because there is a proverb that the Zulu people have, which is a very famous proverb among the Zulu. And it says that the people were gossiping at the well that Shaka would never be king. But even as they gossiped, he was entering the third year of his reign. You know what that means? That means let them go ahead and think they are stopping us, but they don't know we've already, we already won. The victory is certain. The victory is certain and the pieces are in place. So I come to you tonight here at United African Movement with 
a heart full of gratitude. Uh, gratitude because, uh, you know, if you do not need me, from time to time, I believe I need you. So I'm real happy to just come and just share with this community. And I want to just recognize Brother, Brother Shakur Africanus, who has come up to Temple to help me struggle. He has watched my back. He has taken care of me. The brother has been, he has been there, he works here, but he comes to, he comes to Temple and he makes certain, he watches, he knows what's going on, he looks at everything, he, he, he takes care of all the things that we need to take care of. And that's why I know everything that I need to know that's going on at Temple. I am aware of what things are. It's because I have a strong brother who gives good direction and advice. So I want to thank him publicly because sometimes you know you know you out there fighting the struggle if you don't have somebody that got your back you can definitely go over the precipice and I want to thank that brother because that brother is always there for me one of the things that the Europeans did when they began the process of imperialism after the voyages of Columbus, the first one being the voyage of 1492. After that voyage, almost overnight, the European nations gathered ships to move into the Caribbean and into the Americas. And in the next 10 years, from 1492 to 152, they had moved hundreds of ships into the Caribbean and even going into Brazil. The idea of this imperial move was to extend what had happen with the question of European Renaissance in their mind. And they call it the Renaissance period because for them, it was what they considered a rebirth. And it was considered a rebirth because during the period of the Greek and Roman civilizations, which of course, as we know, were young civilizations. During that period, certain individuals of the European background, such as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Isocrates, Thales, Strabo, Quintilian, Cicero, these individuals had developed on the strength of the African past something that they could conceivably call a response of culture to the environment. That's what they had done. But not long thereafter, the European cultures that had been influenced by Greece and Rome fell into a period where Christianity came into being in its European expression, moved into monasteries where you had monks and hermits living together, and they then decided that only the clergy should have the books. And so they 
kept these books to themselves and they would spend many years studying the books over and over again. But the books were not in the hands of the masses. The masses had no books. The books were in the hands of the elite, the clergy, and only the clergy could come down and interpret for the masses of people. That was, that was a period that they call the Dark Ages, but we call it the White Ages. This was a period of fog. Nobody could see clearly. It was a period when those who constituted a class of leaders decided that only they could interpret the words from the books. This was a period of great ignorance because that whole society was run over by ignorance. Everything was nothing. I mean, it was just, I mean, you can't imagine the ignorance that was going on. You know, we today like to think that the Europeans have given us so much. And I hear people say that sometimes, but you know, they did give us a whole lot. But I'm going to tell you something. You got to go back and read history. You know what these people were doing in this time? They had created something that they call oaths and ordeals and duels. Now, these were the three measures of proof. If you want to prove something to somebody, or prove that somebody did something or didn't do something, you had three choices. You could prove it by an ordeal, you can prove it by an oath, or you could prove it by having a duel with somebody. And whoever won the duel, if you cut the other person with your sword first, and that person died, then you were telling the truth. This was ignorant stuff. No, the ordeal was something like this. If two people had a dispute and you really wanted to know who was right, what they would do, they would tie to your body sometimes a piece of iron and then put you in some water. And if you drown, you were lying. I mean, this was ignorant stuff. They would take, tell you to put your hand in water, you and somebody else. Who could keep their hand in the boiling water longest was telling the truth. That's, I'm telling you, this was what the Europeans were doing. This was their system of how you prove something. And then, of course, they had the oaths. They would give you oaths, and you had to say these oaths without stammering. Because if you stammered, then you were lying. Those were the three measures of proof that they were practicing. They were practicing up to the 1400s. That's, that's, there's nothing like that in Africa. That's ignorant stuff. That has nothing to do with, with nothing, but their, their own belief. And their belief was a false belief. It was an inauthentic belief. It was fakery because it was not based on any concrete evidence of facts. And that's why when Marsilio Ficino was sent to bring back books by Cosimo de Medici of Florence, and he went and he brought back the Corpus Hermeticum. When the Corpus Hermeticum, that great African book, was brought back to Florence, it was the first book translated to begin the European Renaissance. European Renaissance didn't begin with Plato's Republic. It began with the African book, the Corpus Hermeticum. The Hermetic text. 
And these hermetic texts were named for the African god Jehudi, who was also called Thoth, who was also called Hermes. As the first book to bring, he said, the, the Medici said to uh, Ficino, he said, please tr tr translate this one first. Because this one is supposed to have all of the wisdom of the ancient Africans. And that was the book that set the record straight for the Renaissance. You know, and I tell you, we just don't know a lot about ourselves. We, we are some extremely creative people. You know the solemn processions that people have, like at graduations and commencements, they have a whole lot of them now this period of time. We started that. I'm not just saying we started it, just to say we just claim that we claim right there, but we started that. Herodotus says in his book on Egypt that the solemn assemblies were started by the Africans. We started them. You know the so-called uh, academic gowns that people wear? We started that. That came from Africa. This didn't start with Europe. It was only after the Renaissance that the Europeans began to follow a pattern that they had heard about going on in Africa. All of this knowledge came to them from somewhere else. And this is based on the traditions of our people. Let me tell you something. These people needed in the 15th century to create something that would go along with their economic imperialism. And you know what they had to create? They had to look for the true Negro. Looking for the true Negro became the occupation of a whole the great number, a vast number of Europeans looking for this true Negro. And let me tell you something about this true Negro. This true Negro had no name. The true Negro had no ethnic identity. This true Negro that they were looking for had no language, no history, no humanity. This was what they were looking for. How do you find, and, what, and wherever they thought they found the true Negro, they said, this is a true Negro. And you know what they were trying to find? They were trying to find a way to assert what they conceived to be their own superiority. That's what they were trying to do. The unfortunate thing is that the people, the African people, who were victimized by this imperialism and by this search on their part for the true Negro often fell victims to the true Negro identity and then wanted themselves to fall in line with the white estimation of them as true Negroes. So when we say that there was no history then you got black folk who say, you know, if we had had more writing, maybe we would have had a history. Excuse me. If we had more history, more, more writing, we would have had more, more, more history. But we don't have, there's no, there's no writing. There's no writing in our tradition. Since we don't have any writing, well, what can we say? I, I hear Negroes talk to me like that. Understand, though, you know, and I, you know, I, as I have grown older, Dr. McIntyre, I love that woman. Let me just tell you, as I have grown older, I have more, I have more patience with Negroes. I, I, I do because I understand the condition out of which Negroes have come. And I, and I have tried to help Negroes get out of Negroness so that 
in their overhaul of their mentality and cultural understanding and consciousness, they will be clear on who they are. And that is why Dr. Abu Abari, who is the associate professor and an associate chair of the Department of African American Studies at Temple University and I, this is why we produced this book. This book is nearly 900 pages. This is a book that we produced in the last four years. It was a hard book to produce. And in this, in this case, Dr. Barry, by the way, is not the professor I was talking about. Dr. Barry is all right. Dr. Barry and I worked hard on this project, just like the other professor was supposed to work hard on that project. But we worked hard on this project. And we, we believe we have produced a book that will be, be the first step toward the building of some semblance of um, a canon for African Americans. And we did this, and African people generally, we did this because it's the kind of book I wanted when I was in school. And it's the kind of book I needed in my home. And it's the kind of book that brings African intellectuals who are in the Caribbean and South America, on the African continent and North America, bring everybody together in one book. African intellectual heritage, we call it. And in this book, we have tried, and we call it a book of sources. And we start in the book, we start in the book at 2700 before the Christian era. Because we wanted to say to people, look, you don't have to say, you don't have to have people say there's nothing before the time of Jesus Christ in Africa. No, 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, African people were writing. And not only were they writing, they were writing beautiful stuff important stuff, stuff that's significant to us now. In fact, in 2400 BC, the Pharaoh Unus, it is recorded, has these words written. Ra Atun, this Unus comes to you, a spirit indestructible, who has laid claim to the places of the four pillars, your son comes to you. This Eunice comes to you. May you cross the sky united in the dark. May you rise in light land, the place in which you shine. Seth, Nephthys, go proclaim to Upper Egypt's gods and their spirits. This Unus comes, a spirit indestructible, if he wishes you to die, you will die. If he wishes you to live, you will live. This 2400 BC, written by African people. Let me tell you something. I wanted a book where I could find, in one book, Hat Shepsut and James Weldon Johnson. I wanted a book where I could find Neferohu and Jomo Kenyatta, and where I could find Olaudo Equiana in the same book as Shake Out the Joke, Franz Fanon in the same book as Harkoff, and Alain Locke in the same book as Winamon, in the same book as John Mbidi, and the same book as Amy Jock. Garvey and Abdias do Nascimento and Carter Woodson and Ida B. Wells and Angela Davis and Ar Moses and Tutmosis and Nat Turner and Julius Nayeri and CLR James and James Baldwin and so forth and so on. That's the kind of book and many, many others in one book. So if you want to read King's I Have a Dream speech, you can read it in the same book where you can read about Edward Wilmot Blyden 
and what Brighton had to say. You don't have to go look for four or five different books. It's all in one book. And this we wanted to do on the basis of themes such as the creation of the universe. Because we started at the very beginning. The creation of the universe. The earliest people to talk about creation are African people. So we have for you two of the earliest, the Heliopolis creation narration and the Memphite declaration of the deities. But then in addition to that, we also have James Weldon Johnson's The Creation, bringing it right back home. We have a section called Religious Ideas. And we have in those religious ideas some of the classic works of African religious thought. Then we have culture and identity. And then after culture and identity, we have philosophy and morality. And then we have society and politics. And then we have resistance and renewal. We have those sections because what we wanted to do was to present an African intellectual heritage information across many themes so you will, you will be armed. You will walk out, people say, what's your Bible? This is your Bible. This is your Bible. This is, this is, these are the great thoughts that have been thought by black people. Right here. What's the Bible anyway but a holy book? Right? What's any more holy than you? And I always say, the only chosen people in the world are self-choosing people. That's the way you get to be chosen people. you self-choosing. And if you're self-choosing, then it works for you. If you're not self-choosing, it ain't going to work for you. And so African intellectual heritage becomes fundamental to this understanding. We have also provided a glossary because there's some of these names in here. You need to know what they mean. So we've given you a whole glossary in the back. And not only that, we have also given you perhaps the most definitive statement of sources for these documents. You know, because sometimes, I must tell you, sometimes we read a book and you say, boy, I wish I could go and find the original copy of this. Where did this guy get this from? And you don't even know where he got it from. You have no idea. So you know what we did? We went through each one, and you can go right back to the back of the book, and we will tell you exactly where it is, where you can go and get it for yourself. You can go look at it for yourself. It's all in, in the book. And this book, The African Intellectual Heritage, just came out on Monday, and this is the first time here at the UAM, uh, United African Movement, where it is being uh, exhibited. This is the first exhibition of it. And that's because, that's because Sister Leola Maddox made certain that we, we got it here and, and she kept on uh, Brother Shakur and other people and we were able to get it here. But I, wanted, I just wanted to tell you a bit about it and let you know that, that, that this book, we believe, is the beginning of just making our knowledge uh, widely accessible to the masses because the masses have had hard times. We get up here sometimes and speak and we're talking about this was written in the ancient Egyptian text and this was written in the Ethiopian text and if you never saw the Ethiopian text, if you never saw the Egyptian text, you don't know for yourself so now you can know for yourself. You can turn right to where I turn and you can read right from the text. You can read such statement when she came to power as a pharaoh, what she said. You can read that for yourself. Hatshepsut was very, I mean, her assertion of her power, how she placed herself as a woman in a role of a king, right there in the book. We got it for you. We tell you where you can find, where you can find it. The, the Zulu Declaration, personal de declaration, and one of the most powerful statements for our children the Zulu uh, declaration, we find it from the Zulu declaration. The Zulu declaration is a personal statement that I have rarely heard. I've heard maybe once or twice. And an old friend of mine who no longer is with us, but who is with us in spirit, Jordan Ngubani, who was from South Africa. I met him in the late 70s in Washington, D.C. And when uh, 
I had found, when I had talked to him, he said to me, I want to share something with you. And what he shared with me was something that I, thank you, was something that I have always retained. I retained it, he wrote it down for me. This is a Zulu personal declaration. It goes like this, I, I, pardon? Okay, we're paid. 371. I, somebody got the book. That's quick. It says, I, I am. This is what, now, let me just back up. This is what the Zulu people, some of the Zulu people teach their children to say. I, I am. I am alive. I am conscious and aware. I am unique. I am who I say I am. I am the value ukobo essence. I forever evolve inwardly and outwardly in response to the challenge of my nature. I am the face of humanity. The face of humanity is my face. I contemplate myself and see everything in me. I perceive that which I perceive is, is form. Form is an unchanging value. Value is eternal consciousness. Consciousness is that in which all things have their origin. It does not change. It exists from eternity to eternity. It is an infinite cluster of clusters of itself. It is forever evolving in response to the challenge of its nature. It is ultimate value. It is ukobo the value of metamorphosis into a phenomenon. Each phenomenon is a total of smaller forms. Phenomenon, phenomena forms clusters to produce other phenomena. The cosmic order is an indefinite total of forms and phenomena. I am a phenomenon. I am a person. I am essence. I am the consciousness. The infinity is a unity. It cannot be destroyed. I am a constituent of the unity. I cannot be destroyed. You remember what I read to you from Unas? 2450 BC, when Unas appeared before Ra Atum and say, said, it is I, Unas, who comes before you who claims the places of the four pillars, a spirit indestructible. And you see it again in the Zulu declaration. I cannot be destroyed. The infinity and I are inseparable. I cannot exist outside of the infinity, for there is no outside of it. Everything is inside the infinity. Ukobo or essence is the infinity. It is a whole and on and on it goes for several pages. That's a declaration. Can you imagine what would happen if we taught our children that? What kind of people they would be? On what discipline it is based? And that is why I say to you that one thing is certain, that our struggle is a continuing struggle, but we can win the struggle. And when the white people found the true Negro, what did they do to the true Negro in their image? They reviled the Negro. They crucified the Negro. In fact, the, the lynchings of the African people in this country between 1890 and 1919 were some of the most awful, gruesome things you have ever, ever heard of. Go and get the book, 100 Years of Lynching. I read that book from time to time just to keep me straight about where I am in this country. Some of the things that they did, you wouldn't believe what they did. They would lynch an African. 3,000 white people would lynch an African, sing songs, cut off pieces of the person's body and then 
put them in vinegar to say I was there when we lynched that person. Oh, they did more awful things than that. They were awful people. This is what I tell you when I say, when we talk about the church bombings today, what we have to talk about is the state of mind of people who believe that other people do not deserve to exist on the earth. These are crazy people. This is insanity. This is why Akbar calls it insanity. This is an insane situation. And when you have people like that, what you have to do is at least, as Wade Noble says, vaccinate yourself, inoculate yourself with enough energy and power and information and knowledge that they cannot overcome you. That's what you've got to do. Because I tell you, in closing tonight, the African has risen again. They may have tried to crucify us, but we are risen again. And we are risen in every field, in the sciences, in art, in history, in spirituality. And we just have to keep our young people on track. Because one of the things I've discovered is that our young people today have no sense of history. They have no sense of respect and no sense of discipline. And if you don't have a sense of history, you don't have a long view of history, you, you fall for anything. And I, you know, I tell you, one of the things that we say in this tradition is you respect the elders. But I tell you something, it's more than a, just a word that we say. You gotta, you gotta respect elders for the experiences that they have had. You just, you know, and I, I talk to my children the same way. You just, you just do this because I know what I'm talking about. You know, I may not be able to, I'll argue you on it, but I know what I'm talking about. I, I, so we have, we have deep arguments over. He's very logical. We want to be very rational on these things. But sometimes you just have to say, but you know, I, I have experience. Just do it because I know what I'm talking about. And this is the way we have to treat elders. The elders have seen so many things. They have been so many places. They may not be able to put it in words exactly or precisely for us at the moment that we are, but they know what they're talking about. And this is what I think sometimes young people don't understand that. You gotta have, you gotta, that's why you gotta have some sense that the person has something in back of what she is saying based on where she has been and she knows certain things that's why when I talk to young people I know I know from at least the 50s and the 60s I know what struggles we went through and I know how we went through them I knew the dangers and I tell somebody you know I was at UCLA for many years and when the two brothers were killed at UCLA struggling over black studies, I was the compromised candidate to take the leadership of the Center for African American Studies. I, I, know, I know from whence these things come. So when I talk, I don't say this every day when I talk to people, but it's something in my background, it's something I know something about, you know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying to people, and I'm saying to you, is that we have to teach our young people to have respect and have discipline. Those two things, respect and discipline. We gotta respect them, but they gotta respect the elders. And sometimes it may not be possible for you to explain at that moment every reason, but you got to have respect just because you ought to have respect. This is the way it was in the ancient time. This is the way it ought to be. This is the way it was, I don't know about Brother Alton, but I believe it was so when he was growing up in Georgia because when I was growing up in Georgia, that's the way it was. You just, we just had that respect for Big Mama. Let me tell you something. And this is the last bit, thing I want to say. Our music is everywhere. And I have, whether you're in Japan or in Mexico, 
You see the music. You hear it. It's everywhere. In some respects, African music is the most successful creation of African people. We have, um, it is in many ways an insidious victory. It is the, it, it is the conquering of spaces and forces where we will never be. Everywhere on this globe, if you talk about popular music, you're talking about African rhythms. This is fundamental. I know how our ancestors built the pyramids. I know how they did it because I understand something about music. I understand something about what is possible when you get everyone moving and thinking in the same direction, on the same chord. It's very important. And I tell you, we have never yet utilized to its maximum the creative genius of African music. We haven't done it. Two weeks ago, at the International African American Music Association, I said to the musicians and the black music executives that the time has come for us to use our music, all of our musics, for liberation. If we did this, if we were, if we were able to, there were, I mean, you know, and I, this was the first time, I know Charcy, you know, I know you hang around this a lot, but I tell you, this was my first time being with so many musicians and musician executives. And you know, they are some wonderful people. And you know, we, and I had a, I left with a different impression than I went with. Because I met some of the most conscious people I had ever met. And some of these young people, some of them very young, but are the greatest um, producers of music, who are keen. I mean, you meet a young man like Puffy, 26, 27 years old, multimillionaire, who's talking about African music for liberation. I mean, you, when you start meeting young people who are beginning to understand how music can make a difference, then, you know, what you began to see is the great potential of our people. I want to say to you, let our young people create. Guide the creations, but let them create. Don't stop the creations. Don't, don't stifle the create, creative energy, but guide it, direct it. Let them see what is possible on the basis of the historical record and let them create off of that. You will be surprised how many pyramids we can build. And I say to you in the end, we'll build those pyramids. We built them with Patari, popular traditional African religion everywhere. It always had priests and priestesses, always had mediums, always we had diviners. These were nascent scientists. The diviners were people who understood the nature of organic and inorganic matter. That's what diviners were. These were, these were scientists. This was a guy could look at wood and tell you whether it's going to rain or not. This was a scientist. These were, these were the very earliest scientists, were the diviners in the African tradition. We had pharmacists. We didn't call them pharmacists in Georgia, we call them root doctors. But these, we, we had them. They knew the operation of all kinds of plants and herbs. They can tell you what herb you can use for what ailment. They knew that. And we had psychiatrists. People call them witch doctors. They were not witch doctors. People call them witch doctors because they threw out witches. But no, they were not witch doctors. They were people, they were, they were, just, they were just like 
other people who were mind healers. And they were mind healers because they lived in the village with everybody else and they knew who was crazy and who wasn't. They could tell the story. You didn't have to be so smart to know what was going on. Somebody come to you with a problem, you knew what the problem was. And they healed these people. Yeah, I've been to a lot of them. We all need to go to them. African mind healers. I have my African mind healers. The African mind healers make sure the things are going all right. We have them, many in our tradition, come out of our history. Our history is straight on. We are straight on people. No people have ever come as far as we have come against such odds in such short period of time. The African people surviving in this country have survived against everything. I always say we are the children of the ones they could not kill. And Weldon Johnson said it's stony the road we trod. Bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed? We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path out of the blood of the slaughtered through the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. <laughs>